There we go. Cool. So welcome, everybody. Um, this was originally designed to be a like Canvas uh, or excuse me, Zoom uh, breakout room session. But with more people back on campus now, we kind of decided to make this um, a little bit of the Zoom stuff, but more about like collaborative learning on campus. I kind of do group work in a face to face setting as well as the online setting. Um, in case you don't know us, uh, my name is Matt West. I'm the instructional technologist with City, and we've also got Peg helping out here. She is one of our uh, lovely instructional designers. Thank you. Cool. Um, so just a couple of goals, more than a couple of goals for today. Uh, we wanna talk about some barriers to collaboration. So things that would prevent your students from collaborating successfully in the classroom. We're gonna talk about plenty of those. Um, also things that you can do to enhance communication, um, like talking about information sharing and other professional development skills that you could do during class time. We'll talk a little bit about managing breakout rooms in Zoom effectively, because that can be like a really tricky thing, especially with larger classes. Um, then we're also gonna talk about a couple of tips and tricks to get your students to engage with each other. And then also we're gonna talk about uh, developing your own style of collaboration. And do we have that sign up sheet, Peg? Oh, no, well, I was just, actually just going to put here, it in the so. chat. There's only yeah, two I, people. I think we can remember. I think so. Yeah, I don't think we need it. <clears throat> cool. OK, let me just switch slides here. OK, so the first thing we're going to talk about is why make your class collaborative? Like, why not just lecture to them for an hour, hour and a half, or however long your class is? Like, they're just sitting there and basically listening. So, like, why make it more collaborative? Um, I think the first reason is that students learn more. Um, there's been a lot of studies that have been done. We've got some links at the end there. There's, like, one that Harvard did. There's a couple others there. But... Um, it's interesting because a lot of students say that they prefer lecture, but when it actually comes down to it, if you compare their assessment results, they actually perform way better when you do like more collaborative sessions. So it's interesting that they prefer the lecture or a lot of students prefer lecture according to like the statistics. Maybe it's because they don't want to do the collaborative work. It's a little bit like more involved, you know. Uh, but they actually do perform better. So that's always a good thing. We want our students to make better grades, you know. Uh, it's also more challenging for students. So rather than just sitting there listening, uh, they're going to be engaging more with uh, the instructor. They're also going to be engaging with their classmates. It's going to make it a little bit more challenging for them. And like I said earlier, studies show that the final the student's final grade for the course is higher and there are also student uh, fewer students who fail the course so that helps with retention rates a lot and um, also having students work together with other students um, that helps them with communication skills which are really valuable in the workplace like sometimes that's even more valuable than like the content itself um, and not only that uh, it helps them like with group work because, you know, a lot of times in the work environment, you have to work with other groups of people and not just yourself. So when they're working together as a group, uh, it's really helping with that. And uh, another thing we can add to is I've had multiple students tell me, so I actually teach uh, some classes online and my students tell me that in many cases, they learn just as much from their classmates as they do from the instructor. So in a traditional lecture environment where the students really aren't saying anything, they're not going to get any of that information from their classmates. Maybe if this classmates ask questions or something, but that's about it. So those are some reasons to make your class collaborative. Um, I think just it's just a really good idea. Anything you want to add on that, Peg? No, I think you did a good job covering it, Matt. Thank you. And one of the, you know, one of the first things I always like to do when I'm trying to get students to engage to plug in right, is I'll oftentimes start with a poll of some sort. Um, and if you guys want to jump in and be active learners with us, you can go to poll everywhere, pollev.com and enter Margaret Check 486, and you can tell me what your barriers are to collaboration. And we'll share the responses as they come up here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. 
And hopefully you guys are all busily typing things into polev.com forward slash Margaret check 486. I wish I could change my username because it's way too long to, te to type in. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because I did this, as I said, I did this earlier today and um, I did this exercise earlier today. And it was amazing to me how many people came up with the same answers, but then there were some really interesting new answers that I hadn't considered before. So are you guys able to get, I'm not sure I know the content well enough. That one's is a good one. Yeah. And remember, you're not identified on this. So, you know, Todd and Michelle don't feel like you're going to be, you know, um, shown up on the, on the screen or anything. Distance and the asynchronous mode of communication is challenging. What else, what else distresses you guys? Anything? That's okay. We can talk can about okay? those. Sorry. Oh, this is Michelle. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, wonderful. Um, so one of the things I would say is a barrier, and I sort of know this from experience after a failed attempt at a flipped classroom design, um, is this general sentiment from students when we do go into group work or, you know, any type of work that kind of puts the onus of the work onto them. I hear a lot, you know, you're here to teach me what I'm paying you to teach me why are, you know, mm. why am I having to teach myself? So that's been a big barrier for me. That's a good one. And, you know, I've heard that one. I've heard that one on, on several occasions, not, not, not as much at Rush, but at other institutions that I've worked for. And, and that's where you just have to throw the research back and back at them and tell them, look, you know, studies have shown that peer-to-peer -peer learning and group learning helps that effort. And yes, of course, you're here to learn from me, but it, it, you're, we're also, d we're, we're setting you up for success going forward. Um, and you will need you will need to have these skills as you go forward and 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 work with um, you know other groups as as you progress through your career. So you know I I basically just turn it around on them when they give me that when they give me I've had that I'm paying you to teach me yeah and therefore you should let me teach the way I teach and you'll be amazed at the results at the end um you know and that's mm -hmm. that's usually the best way to to get around that one thank you to those that contributed um I'm going to tick down the list here and actually let me just bring this over to um my other screen and then we can I can keep sharing um so I'm not sure that I know the content well enough. That's, a, that's an outstanding barrier to collaboration. And that's when I would say as much as possible, you know, the three rules of thumb are to practice, practice, and then yeah, practice some more. So, and the other thing I would say is keep your scope very limited to what you do know well enough. So if you're being tasked with talking about um, I don't know, anatomy, and you really only are comfortable with the, um, you know, the lower torso and um, limbs, then don't be, don't, don't spend any time talking about, at least not in this, you know, give yourself time to prepare for the next lecture where you talk about the thoracic area, you know, so keep your content narrow to the point until you can learn it well enough to present it. Um, and then again, practice, practice, practice. Um, in terms of students are afraid of making a mistake in front of the peers, that's where, in my in my estimation, authenticity comes in. So I've made mistakes. I'm sure that you all have made mistakes in in your lifetime as as teachers and as practitioners and as human beings. And so I am very candid with my students, and I never ever try to present myself as all knowing or you know the sage on the stage, so to speak. I want them to know that that's how we learn. And in, and in fact, there's, I read an article, I'll try to find it for y'all, but um, I read an article about um, when this generation of students has been sort of trained to fail, to learn through failure. If you think about video, game, video games, right? I don't know if you guys are gamers or not, but when you're playing a video game, um, you start out with the really easy challenges and then you work up to the harder and harder challenges. And then by the time you're at the end of the game, you're working against a big boss or something like that. Then you have to really learn what the attacks are and how to counter those attacks. And so the idea is that you build those skills and then it, ultimately you get to the point where, yes, you can defeat the, 
you can defeat the big bad boss. So you can even use that as an analogy when people say, when people are worried about making mistakes, you know, tell them, think of it as a video game and make the mistakes so that you can learn from them. Much better to make a mistake here in a learning environment than it would be to say, make, a mis- make a, that same mistake in, a, in, in an actual surgical theater or mm-hmm. when you're diagnosing patients, right? So, you know, really put it into context for them. Um, with In terms of distance and the asynchronous mode of communication, I found that that one's gotten less intense as we've progressed into the pandemic and become more comfortable with technology and with Zoom and whatnot. Um, there is, there's the, the only thing I can offer there. And by the way, the rest of you feel free to jump in if you want to add something at any point. Um, the, but the, when it comes to the asynchronous mode of communication, I found that, um, again, authenticity is key. So, you know, be respectful of the fact that people might not be able to turn their cameras on because of where they live, or, you know, they have six little kids running around or, you know, their dog is barking or whatever. Um, be respectful of that, that element, be, um, be willing to put yourself out and be vulnerable on camera. Um, I hate being on camera. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I loathe being on camera, but it's part of what we do now. So I'm okay with it. I've become, I've through practice, I've gotten okay with it. And I think it's the same for students. So positive reinforcement and taking small steps, not asking them to present, um, you know, the, the, the uh, preface of their dissertation, but just have them do small, small activities that will help them to, to get used to participating online and rewarding that participation. Somebody else in the other um, session this morning made a great, they had a list of incentives that they used. And they incentivized people to participate in their in their online sessions by things like um, virtual Snickers bars, um, you know, and the promise to buy them a Snickers bar when they were on campus, or um, they gave them an extra point or a half a point on the next exam, or they, um, what were some of the other things that they did? They, they, um, they gave them hints for what was going to be on the next exam based on their participation. So if they participated, they got the hint. If they didn't participate, no hints for you. So, I mean, there are creative ways that you can kind of get people to loosen up in the, in the, in the, in the online world, I think. Um, this one's an interesting one. Students at different places in their projects. Who, who put that one up? Could you talk about that one a little bit more? And if it was an ID, that's okay. That was me. Uh, oh, so in the classes I teach, it's we have um, scaffolded projects over the course of the semester. And some people come in raring and ready to go. And, and maybe they're farther along in the background work in their, their dissertation, leading towards the dissertation and things like that. And, and maybe f- further along and doing better work, whereas others are still trying to figure out their research questions, and so it makes it harder for them to to keep up and 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 put a create as great of detail of work, be it on a protocol for a literature review or a grant proposal on a grant writing course or things like that. And so some people are going to have um, a different level of detail and and refinement in what they're putting forth. Um, out there in the discussion board and for peer review and things like that. And so that can, I think, lead some students to be less comfortable sharing and participating and collaborating if they feel self-conscious about where they are in the process. I think, I think that's an absolutely amazing point to remember when you're assigning work. And it's something that as a faculty member, you can you can call back to that regularly and remind people that everybody's going to be at a different stage. Everybody's and you can actually, again, it's part of the authenticity, right? Acknowledge the challenges that they're having. Better yet, ask them the challenges that they're having. Even if you do something like in an online forum like this, you go around the room and do, okay, so Matt, where are you? And what are you what are you dealing with? And kind of make it just really conversational, no points no really low stakes, really mellow, you know, where are you? What can we do to help you? How do you, how can we support you? And, and in, when you do that often enough, people will begin to trust you that you're not looking to, most students come into classes and correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but most of the time when I went into classes, I was pretty sure that the instructor was looking for ways to, to make sure that I failed. 
I mean, that was my own insecurity. I know that now, but back then I was sure that they didn't, they didn't want me to pass anything. They were looking for, they were, how can they, how can they make, make sure I fail? And that's, I don't think many professors actually do that. I think most professors want to be helpful and supportive and caring and, you know, it, it's, it, but students have this preconceived notion of what being in, being in school is all about. Other thoughts on that, guys? Anybody? And then the last one that came in on the list, since I didn't really give anybody a chance to reply, so I'll give everybody 10 seconds or so. That's my big mistake is I forget to um, pause. I tend to rush too much and I've been scolded on that many times. So still no responses. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the last one, which is students may be used to sitting back and receiving information. And so, and so they are nervous and reluctant when asked to collaborate. This one is, I call this the baby bird syndrome. And baby bird syndrome is basically from grades K through 12, they're supposed to just sit there and be quiet. Or it, so that was what it used to be like. I'm seeing a lot more active learning in K through 12 now, a lot more. And so I think we're gonna start seeing that particular um, barrier kind of dissipate a little bit more, but definitely it's it's still out there. And and the, again, the only thing to do is just nurture the students and convince them that it's okay. It, you're gonna be okay to talk and create situations where it's safe to talk. So think pair share is a great one. If you do, um, you know, if you do discussion groups and go into think pair share where it's just one student and one other student, it's not an overwhelming, it's not one student talking in front of 500. Um, that's really helpful in that regard as well. Other thoughts before we move on to our next? Hag, one thing you could do for that last one there is set expectations from the beginning of class. Like just tell students yeah. that this is not a traditional, like you sit there and you get lectured to class. This is a class that you're going to be expected to collaborate in. And I think setting them up from that from the get go is like really helpful. Uh, that's what I tell my students. And I even do like some sort of team building stuff, which I know some people don't really like, but I'll just get them with another like classmate and just have them say like their name and like where they live, like why they're taking the class, stuff like that. And doing that from day one, they get used to that sort of collaboration with their classmates and then it becomes a lot easier. Right, and that's a, that's a really good point too. And it brings up the whole idea of establishing relationships and, and creating right from the beginning of the class, helping the students to see that, you know, that other people have good information to share. I have good information to share. We're gonna collaboratively get from point A to point B to point Z together. Um, and, and it takes a lot of the stress off, I think. Um, so I promise today that I'm gonna try to make everything more exciting than watching the paint dry. And using a little graphic, a little meme, a little humor is okay. And please do it. If you, if you don't, you should. If you're already doing it, congratulations, you're awesome. Um, I was gonna, I was designed this to be a mitten toss, but I'm gonna, no, I'm still gonna do a mitten toss because you know my instructional design team is here. The instructional design team is here and I know that they're here to support. So we're gonna do a mitten toss. So a mitten toss, if you're in the classroom, you actually have a mitten and you toss it to somebody and you ask them a question and they have to answer. But the spin on the mitten toss is that I like to use is that instead of me tossing the mitten each time, you know, if I throw it to Matt first, Matt then throws it to Michelle, Michelle then throws it to Lynette, Lynette throws it to Emily, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, it takes the pressure off of you as an instructor. And so what I'd like to do is just for a minute, think about your own tone and body language and background. And in this case, I'll start it off and I'll say that um, my biggest barrier to collaboration with myself, you know, what do I do that creates a barrier is that I go too fast and I intimidate people um, because they think I know a whole lot more than I do. They, it's just, that's, that's what people think. So that's my barrier. Um, I'm gonna toss it to Matt and let him respond. I would say for me, it's similar. Uh, I'll explain something to someone and, you know, I, I know a lot about the topic and then I forget that not everybody knows a lot about that topic. And you really have to really have to remember that, Hey, these are people that are just beginning to know about this stuff. So I really need to dumb it down for them, but do it in like a respectful way. That's like not condescending at the same time. It's really tricky. Uh, I'll pass it to Laura. Um, 
I, you know, I, mine is related to yours. I think one, I talk too quickly. And two, I think I make assumptions about people or my students and the knowledge they have going into it, like you said, Matt. And I, I, in the past, I would tend to teach to what I perceived as that highest level of knowledge um, because I did not want to either disappoint nor um, give the impression that I was not <laughs> the ex, you know, the, yeah. the, the expert on that content. And so what I think often happened is that I left a lot of other students in the dust by making those presumptions. And maybe I, they were completely incorrect presumptions, but altogether, uh, they probably were. <laughs> that's, I mean, I think that that's something you can often do when you're starting out teaching and you have all this ego wrapped up in it and you want to be sure that you, um, you, you're, you're, you're um, presenting yourself as a, a, a content expert, right? Um, while forgetting that it's really not about you, it's about them. Um, so I'm gonna toss it to Todd. Okay, um, I'm sure I tend to talk too fast. Um, <laughs> I think that's just a habit that a lot of people have when they're teaching. And um, I'm known to go off on tangents. Um, mm -hmm. And so I have to have, kind of uh, my agenda for the, the class session to keep me on track, especially because often a student will ask a question, which will then lead us to talk more about that and, and go, and then there are follow-up questions and, and we go down other totally unrelated things, but things that about, because I teach in the PhD program, primarily things about um, the PhD program or about academic life and nursing or research that aren't really taught in the courses, but they are curious about. And so, you know, we have a fairly open and, and relaxed atmosphere. And so they, I guess, feel comfortable enough asking those questions. And so we go off on those tangents and then I have to bring it back to the things that we need to actually cover. Um, I also tend to have, I tend to talk with my hands, as you might have noticed, which gets really interesting on Zoom. Um, and so I have to sometimes remind myself to reel that in and I also know that I have this verbal have habit of speaking in like in extremes. So like, well, you know, we always have you know, th this is always you know in in uh, superlatives rather than than couching it that you know frequently this happens. I tend to say this, you know, oh yeah, this always happens, and, and then I have to walk it back. Um, just because just I kind of flippantly speak in extremes when I know that's not the case and it's just a bad habit. No, those are great. Those are great. I, I put in the chat, Todd, um, it's your, you have what's called the Peter Rabbit syndrome and uh, that's wandering down garden paths and guilty as charged, completely guilty of that. Until the, and I used to be guilty of that to the point where I wouldn't come back to the original topic and then students would get mad at me because, you know, we ended up talking, we were supposed to be talking about this, but we ended up talking about that. And yeah. yeah. Um, so toss, toss, Todd. Um, I will toss to Lynette. Lynette, are you with us? She might be working on something else. Okay, then I'll take the mitten back. And I will toss to Michelle. All right, thanks. Um, I would say my biggest barrier is that, um, and this is certainly more so for um, in person than than online. But if if you know, kind of my scan of the room, it appears that people are largely disengaged. I get frustrated by that and you know I'll, I'll attempt to kind of re-engage folks and um if they're if if they're not responsive to that I I tend to get the mentality of like right I'm just going to keep moving ahead and power through this like almost take it personally a little bit and I think sometimes I lack that um you know the I, I, a lot of times I think with with really effective teaching, there's like an element of theater almost involved in it. And I've never been a great actress. And so instead of being able to kind of employ some of those strategies, I'm just, like I said, I just sort of put my head down and keep moving ahead if I feel like people aren't really that engaged. So I could 
probably benefit from a not taking it as personally and b um, not um, you know maybe maybe using different strategies or not feeling as discouraged by the strategies I am using if it's not pulling everything everybody back on track. Yeah, that's a one. That's a really hard one, and one of the things I found that works with that that doesn't involve fear, it does involve a little bit of patience. Um, when people aren't paying attention, I stop talking entirely. Mm -hmm. and, I, and okay, I, just, I like that. <laughs> I just wait at the front of the room, and eventually they're all going to look up. And eventually, I'll say, and eventually I'll just say to them, "Okay, now that you're all paying attention again, let's stay mm -hmm. on task and let's move on to the next topic." Mm -hmm. And, and they're, sure. I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not being rude. I'm not being offensive. I'm just, obviously you have things that you feel are very important to you. Like, you know, finish those up and then I'm going to keep talking. And if you do that enough times, people will get the message and not want to be embarrassed because, you know, they're going to feel a little sheepish if they're, if they're playing um, Wordle while they're, you know, right. while they're doing their thing. So, okay, Bronca and Emily, did you want to jump in and add anything before I move on? These are some great, um, great open and um, uh, prompts for us to talk, to keep going on what we've got. So um, if you guys don't have anything, I'm going to move on. Pause. So that was, that was kind of a virtual mitten toss. And then I always like to talk about um, se um, setting your expectations, as Matt mentioned, following through on those expectations. And then the one thing that I always tell people, too, is, you know, you mentioned fear, Michelle, and I don't believe in teaching through fear. Um, I feel like if you're if you're teaching through fear of, you know, either listen to me or else you're going to fail the exam, listen to me or you're going to fail the class. That to me is not a healthy, happy learning environment and people aren't going to be doing it because they feel engaged. They're going to be doing it because they feel like their, their livelihoods are threatened. So I much prefer to be open, warm, approachable, supportive to a point. So you, the dangerous thing about that is that there's also, you get to a point where you have to say, no, this, no, I'm not going to turn myself into a pretzel to make sure that you understand the material. I know what you need to know. I know how to teach what you need to know, and I'm going to stay focused on what you need to know. And so, you know, don't get, don't run the risk of well, falling into that trap of if the students complain loudly enough, I'm going to yield to what they, what they want. I'm going to yield to their demands, right? There's a, there's a really fine line. Collaboration, should be because they want it, they want it because it, you want it to be fun, but it doesn't mean that you're giving over all of your power as a faculty member. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. Yeah. And then I also like to, oh, I forgot, humor is great. Um, and then the probably the biggest thing is be the lecturer that you wished you'd had. So I've had the I've had the the luck of having some really fantastic lecturers in my time, and I listened to them. I take on the components of their their abilities that I really like, and I incorporate them into my repertoire. And I can because because I have I've had so many great experiences as we all have, right? We've all had great teachers in our time. I can become a chameleon depending on what, what my audience needs, right? And so I can, if I feel like I need to step up and be a little bit more firm, I can be that way because I remember Mr. Bosworth doing that in high school. If I, if I feel like I have a really great audience who's going to participate and, and engage with me, then I'm going to lighten it up and I'm going to step back and I'm going to be more like Mr. Um, Dr. Holston, who all he talked about in his classes was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Every single, it was 17th century English literature. But everything went back to sex, drugs, and rock and roll. No idea how he did it, but it was a fabulous class. So, I mean, model yourself, take pieces from people that you really like, and um, it, by all means, incorporate those into your repertoire. Develop a repertoire so you're not always the same lecturer. And that keeps people interested. And then by the same token, I like to remind people that the students are a lot different now than they used to be. You'll notice our little Dora character. I think it's supposed to be Dora. I don't know. I stole the meme. Um, I think she's sucking on a little pacifier. And I thought, well, that's silly. I can't use that at the college level. I'm not making this up. My daughter just bought silicone things to use in her classes because she, she, gets, she needs something to do with her mouth and her hands because she can't talk. She's not allowed to talk through the whole class. So she uses this thing as a in, instead. 
um, she she also stares into space to focus because she has ADHD. She can't look at she's if she is on a Zoom meeting, she's going to look at herself and see what she looks like the entire time because she if if her camera's on because she's worried that she's going to look silly, so she doesn't want to be on camera. So she stares off into the distance. She doesn't always have her camera on. She doesn't. She's very fidgety. Has been since she was in the womb. She sits, I mean, I, I've come into her class when she's on lecture, in lecture, and she's been like upside down on the bed with her feet on the wall. I, I, I don't know. That's how she listens. And she's a straight A student. She's not a, you know, she's not a goofball. She's a good student, but she needs to do the, these things to be able to um, listen effectively. So, you know, just remember that students today are a lot different. We just don't sit face forward with feet on the floor and say, yes, sir, no, sir, anymore. Doesn't happen. So that brings us to PowerPoint. Do we have to use PowerPoint? Is there anything else we can use? Do you guys have any tools that you've been using besides PowerPoint that have worked really well for your uh, classroom presentations? I know of some, but I've not used them. I usually just use minimal PowerPoint um powerpoint but with as little text as possible and images and pictures and stuff to make it more interesting um or have them just sharing my screen and have them watch as i go through something to show them how to do things in certain you know, software programs or things like that but there's you know i know um prezi was popular for a while um but it's kind of limited yeah, Pretzi is one that I caution people with. I, I like Pretzi a lot, but I found that it makes some people really seasick because mm -hmm. of the way that it moves with the slides. And it's basically so, just PowerPoint with motion sickness. It's bad. <laughs> and it, it takes a lot longer to set up Prezi's too. Like a PowerPoint you can create in like five minutes if you really had to, but Prezi, like setting all that stuff up takes yeah. three times as long. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the answer to our question, there, of course, this was a loaded question. The answer to our question is, no, we don't have to use PowerPoint. We can use all different kinds of um, new tools. So I'm going to go ahead and share some of those. Um, we can use Animoto, which makes videos. Right. And I recommend that, you know, this one's just if you're going to do something um, that you're going to Preload for the students, a video, a short little video like this is fun. Flipgrid is fun. Um, I actually didn't put that one into the deck, but I will. Um, we have access to Flipgrid. And there it is. Flipgrid is a video discussion platform that you can use. This isn't actually, you know, very helpful when you're, you, it's not, it's more for offline asynchronous. Um, but it allows you to do all kinds of video discussions. Canva is fantastic. I think Lynette mentioned Canva. And I love this one because you can do presentations, you can do posters, you can do flyers, you know, and, and the nice thing is, is you can have students do these things using these tools and allow them to present something, which if you give, if you do anything, if you do nothing else, put the mic in your students' hands as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Like give them the opportunity to talk more than you're talking if you can. Um, somebody mentioned Padlet. I forgot to put Padlet up there. So that's another good one. good one. I love Padlet. And again, most of these are free Mium. So if you want the basic features, they're free. But if you want to get into the more um, extensive ones, then, then you would end up with, um, you'd have to pay a minimal charge for a free account. But I've, I've been successful just do, going with free stuff. So Padlet is fun. Um, Laura likes Google Slides, as I do. I found one that I was intrigued by. It's called Haiku Deck. And Haiku, I don't know if you remember, but Haiku is the, is the poetry style. Um, it's four syllables, three syllables, four syllables, or something like that. I have to revisit my English lit to be able to remember. But you can create um, really slick presentations using um, um, reasonably, mostly images and a few words, which is always good. And one that Angela is really hot on right now is Pika Kucha, which is visual storytelling. It's um, 20 slides and 20 minutes, or 20 seconds rather. Sorry, that's a long time. So you, you, instead of using words, you use mostly pictures. And then the, the words 
are in your notes and you present the words as it's easier for students to listen to you when you've got that. And then um, another video platform that I don't know is this one would be good for collaboration, maybe. Um, but if students were to make a video together or, or a presentation together, we have Sway and that's in our Office 365 suite. So all of us have access to that one. Um, oh, and Todd, you just learned about Canva last night. Canva is fun. I love having students make infographics of all kinds. I really do. Because again, the more you can get them digging for the information, even though they might resist it, Michelle, the more you can get them digging for the own information and then you facilitate their understanding of what they've dug up, then that's gonna lead to a deeper learning, I think. Are there any others that I might've, I mean, there's thousands of them out there. So, you know. There, there's no, there, and there's new ones coming out every day. Those are just some of the ones that I liked. And then Matt, I'll let you share this part just because this is a funny, this is just fun. Uh, let me go to it here. Oh, can you open it up, Peg? Oh, sorry, I, did, I didn't, I have to switch the screen share. Yeah. <laughs> So there's nothing wrong with using PowerPoint as long as PowerPoint is done in the right way. And these are some examples of like really bad PowerPoints. And I'm sure we've all seen these before at like different presentations and stuff. Like you're sitting way in the back and you just can't read something or there's like an image up there or there's like a text like this that's like really, really fuzzy. And you just can't see it at all. And then like the person that's presenting is literally just reading motor car and like just they're basically reading from it like well I could have done that you know so this is an example of like what not to do so if you use images just make sure that they are um like easy to see and there's not a lot of text over them like the other one there and there's text that's blurry on there too that's a really bad idea this here is like um, a diagram of some sort and this is something that's better to be printed and hand out people like in person because on the like on a projector board they're not gonna be able to see anything at all you can't even make out like I can barely even read the title there what it's about there's just so so much going on there and then I think we've got a couple more to, right so this one here there's too much text on there so you would basically need to like read this out to them or they would have to read it. Then there's like that awkward silence. So it would be better for this person to like break those down into just like one line of text, maybe like sentences that are 10 words or less. Then, yeah, this one here, this would not be a bad one except for the colors are not great. So it's like a green background with like these like different colors on there and it's blurry too, so. Not yeah, a, our, not a... our, our accessibility, our accessibility um, um, proponents would just be, they're twitching right now. Their eyes are twitching. Yeah, like green tech, <laughs> the green background with yellow text. Then we've got oh. red mixed in there and it's really hurting my eyes to even look at. <laughs> yeah, not By fun. design, by design. <laughs> so this is the money slide. This is ideally what you want a PowerPoint slide to look like. Uh, it doesn't have to have this money background, of course, but um, sometimes like having a photo that somehow relates to whatever the slide is, it can like make it a little bit more fun and engaging for the audience. So just make sure that they're like really slick and well-designed, make your expectations clear. So set those up from the beginning, um, attach some weight to participation. So Try to engage with whoever's watching it, like, you know, what we did, like a poll everywhere or something like that. Set something like, like that up just to make sure that people are paying attention. And also you want to know whether they actually learned the stuff that, that you taught them. Uh, and then be creative in your approach. So don't do what you've always just done before. Try to change it up sometimes because we all, not everybody likes change, but it's fun to, to implement changes sometimes. Uh, and then remember that, some people like you're never going to please everybody. You're never going to have a hundred percent participation. Some people are just going to not like what you're doing. So just kind of keep that in mind. There's always going to be like that, you know, one student who's in the back, not paying attention, even if you've tried everything that you can to engage with all of your students um, and use tools to help you. So some of the tools that we mentioned, there's a bunch of other tools out there. You can always reach out to us for, uh, for any extra ideas. And now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, discussions. 
And Peg, was this your slide or was this my slide? Um, I think it was, I think it was, I think we flipped it, flip flopped it. I'm not sure whose it was, but take it away. You're doing great. All right. That sounds good. Cool. Cool. So we're talking about discussions and this is both really important for in the face-to-face -face class as well as online, right? Because I'm sure we've all had those like group, group discussions and online classes before or even in the classroom. So group discussions are a great way to break things up and kind of let students take over. Um, so one thing that you can do is uh, guided notes. And um, Peg, did you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, so um, I'm actually you know more about guided notes than me. Yeah, no, I'm riffing off of something that um, Laura and Emily brought up in part one. If you were in part one, they talked a lot about guided notes and having a guide, even if you create a document that you give to them or send to them in a, in a Word document of, of things that are important about the lecture so that as they're going through the lecture, they can make notes in that section and have notes that are completely relevant. So they're not spending all their time tracking down exactly every single word that you said because there are students that try to do that and they fail miserably and then they get overwhelmed and then they just throw up their hands and give up. So by giving them guided notes, you're telling them what's important and you're, you're giving them a clue as to when they should take notes and how, what they should, what they should take notes on. So guided notes are super helpful. And, and then, that's one, one, when I was teaching high school, I did that a lot because high school students struggle with taking notes. They really, that's kind of like the first time in their lives that they've had to take notes. And so the guided notes really helps them. And I find that uh, when I was teaching college as well, um, even like freshman, sophomore college students have no idea how to take notes. So having the guided notes, she is really, really helpful. It's you're kind of like getting them started on the process of taking their own notes. Absolutely. And when it comes to discussions too, you want to have like, you're not just going to plop them into a room and, and have them discuss something because, right? You want to have, you want to introduce the discussion. Why are you having a discussion? What's the goal? What's the purpose? And then after they go in and discuss, hopefully you're going to have them present what they've just, what they've just talked about. If you have the time and the luxury of, of having enough time to do that. Um, if not, you can selectively pick a couple of different groups to present what they've talked about and kind of get the, get the juices flowing for other people. Mm -hmm. But the goal is, is to have them share what they learned in their discussion groups with somebody. And then I always like to have some sort of follow up, you know, we go, we break out into discussion, then we have a follow up discussion to discuss to discuss the discussion, and kind of resolve the issues that we're talking about. So we have a, some sort of concrete either solution or identifiable um, bullet point list or something that makes sense, that makes it all make sense for them mm -hmm. at the end. And, and in that in that case, I like to do a takeaway document. Like I, I created a document for the last presentation I did today, and I, I threw it out to people to um, give me a tip or a trick that they knew of how to make their their class more interesting. And I ended up there were about I, I think probably everybody went to that one. That's why nobody's here. Um, but they they ended up giving me a list of like thirty five different things that I now can take and turn into a a, a handout for people mm -hmm. of tips and tricks. So, it, you know, there's something that something useful comes of that discussion. I think that's always important for, the, for discussions. And to, to add on to that, the, the most important thing that I've seen come out of these group discussions is there's always going to be that one student or even more than one student who totally doesn't understand anything that was just taught, but they don't want to admit that to the entire class. But in a smaller group, especially with a group that they've worked closely with before, they will be willing to admit that and they'll say, hey, I don't understand anything. Can you like, just tell me what's going on here? And I've witnessed that so many times throughout my teaching career. And I'm, I'm happy when that happens. Like it kind of tells me, like it helps me as like a teacher that, oh, I should have like, I guess taught that in a little bit different way or maybe checked in on my students before I let them go into discussions. But I'm glad that their classmate was able to describe what we just taught in a little bit different way that they were able to understand. And that's what I was saying, like they learn just as much from their classmates as the instructor is so true. Absolutely. And then another thing, when it comes to discussions, you know, some of the, um, some of the, the, the housekeeping stuff is really important when you're setting them off into a discussion, right? Give them a time limit, tell them how long they're going to have to chat, tell them 
um, give them a specific topic that you want them to focus on or give them a, a, something to do so that they have a deliverable. Um, I like to give people roles. So I'll send people into a discussion. I don't give them the roles. I tell them to assign each other the roles. So I tell people, you know, do a note tape, note taker. Somebody should be doing, keeping an eye on the clock and being a timekeeper. Somebody should be tagged ahead of time as who's going to present to the group when we rejoin the larger session. And then finally, I always add a devil's advocate to pick apart the arguments that we're putting, that you're putting forth so that you've got somebody in there that's arguing against you. Even if it's, even if it's basic and simple, you can still find things and thus you create a bulletproof argument right um so yeah that's i mean discussions can be super powerful um and i also this is a really good point too don't be afraid to give them choice because if you and in and in doing that i like to say if you go into your discussion i want you to talk about this or i want you to talk about that and in giving them that choice again that give, it empowers the students to have a little bit of autonomy about what they want to talk about and how they want to how they want to cater their own educational process. Which brings us to breakout rooms. And I don't know that we wanted breakout because we have such a small group, do we, Matt? Maybe not. We can talk about like talk about okay. it a little bit, maybe as a as a group, but um we're going to talk a little bit about breakout rooms since this was the what the original session was about. So um, Zoom has this really cool feature called a breakout room, just in case anyone's never used them before. Uh, and essentially what you can do is break down your session into smaller groups. And it's really useful for large class sessions. It's even useful for even smaller class sessions. Like let's say you have 20 students and you want them to work one-on-one -on -one with an, another classmate, they're really, really useful for that. Um, for those larger sessions, it can definitely be helpful to maybe have like a TA or something to manage those. I'd say maybe over 50 people, it can be helpful. But for smaller ones, I think you can definitely manage it on your own. Uh, like I said, I teach a class online and I do in, in an hour and a half session, I probably have three to four breakout sessions that last usually five minutes or less. And it's just so students can talk to their classmate about what was taught and also get some practice with it. And usually what I do is I pop in between the different breakout sessions. I'll go in each one for maybe, I don't know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, just to make sure people are on task. And also to make sure people are regurgitating or like, reciting the information that I just taught them in the correct way. And I find also that a lot of really good questions come out of the breakout rooms. So that's where that comes up that they're like, wait, I, I really didn't understand this part. And if I hear that from that one student, then I hear it again, then I know that after the breakout session, uh, that's a really good starting point that, hey, you guys did great in the breakout sessions. There's this question came up a couple of times. Let's go over this again. Um, and breakout sessions, I always tell students like how long they're going to have in there. And I also like the feature that you can, um, at the very end of the session, you give students, like I give them a 60 second warning that like the breakout sessions are going to close. And that way it lets them finish up. It has, they have a whole minute to finish up like what they were doing before it just like, because otherwise you just kick them out. So it's always nice to, to give them a warning. Um, and I find that in terms of breakout rooms, three, like two or three students works really well. If you have a larger class, maybe you can do uh, four sessions, but the two or three works really, really, really well. The more students you have, um, the group work can get a little bit more challenging in like the, the online environment. Hey, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, no, uh, the, uh, I think that covered pretty much everything. Basically, you know, timekeeping and the ping pong table image was chosen on purpose um, because it should be ping ponging back and forth. Discussion should not just be a one and done, whether you're using discussion boards, whether you're using in-person discussions, you know, face-to-face -face discussions, you know, you want to make sure that you're, you're actually using them to their best strengths. Mm -hmm. Um I guess we should probably end with, I don't want to use a breakout room because um, it, 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 there's only the two of you. I think we'll just um, finish off with, um, if you guys have any questions and answers or questions and we might have some answers. Is there anything you wanted to cover more in depth? Do you have other ideas? Are you, did, was this helpful at all?
Yeah, this is great. Nothing else comes to mind at the moment. I'm okay. Well, thank you. I know, for that. I know how to find you if I think of a question. Though. Well, and and that really that's the whole key, right? We want to make sure that you guys know where to find us, and you can email us at any time, city at rush.edu, um, with any questions. I'll send out the PowerPoint sheet with the notes, and I'll also send you the um, from the other group. I'll send you the takeaway document that I created earlier today, so that you have that as well, and um, you'll have some more tools in your toolbox. Hopefully um, you can continue to collaborate. I think you should know that we already collaborate a lot more than a lot of other schools. So you guys are already doing better than a lot of other people. And so anything we do over and above is just making you that much better. So um, never ever hesitate to reach out for help or questions. Okay, great, thank you. All right, thank, thank you so you. much.